Good morning. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that music fun? Man, just makes you kind of want to dance a little bit. Man, I'm still looking for a dancer that might do a routine for that. I think that'd be, would that be fun? That would be fun. I think that'd be great. Bring a dancer in the house. Hey, we're talking about identity. It's our series right now, and it's going to be something that if you'll allow me, if you'll give me the rest of your year, I will give you information that will change the rest of your life. Honestly, truly. Uh, But it's going to require some effort and some energy and some perseverance because we don't get anywhere significant by stopping. And yet we stop so much stuff. How many of you just had fits and starts? You did this, this for, this for a little while, that for a little while, and you just get distracted. I know COVID was a big distraction. Isn't it nice that it's in the rearview mirror? <laughs> I like that. But God wants us to recognize that what we persevere in, we complete and we become. It changes us, it molds us, it shapes us. And the same thing is true about your own identity. Your identity, you'll hear me say this probably till I'm blue in the face, Uh, your identity is the story you tell yourself about yourself. That's your story. That's your identity. And we are about to change your story. God wants to change your story. Uh, Over the next five months, we'll be in a series called Identity, and we're going to be focusing on what God says you are and helping you, training you to let go of everything else you've said about yourself, what the world says about you, what your mistake says about you, what your addiction said about you, all those other things that the world would say about you, God wants you to simply let them go and begin to pursue what He says about you. And when you do that, it'll change who you are. Promise. I promise. Today we're going to look about how that looks, and, and here's the deal. I'm going to do my best every week to bring you the best I got, okay? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try to bring you the best I got, but what I do can't change who you are. What I do can't change who you are. I'm going to have to have you partner with me to take the information, the God-given information that we give here, and apply that to what you do out there. And if you'll do that, it'll transform who you are. We're going to look very specifically at some things you can do today from this day forward that will begin to change the view you have of yourself. If you change how you see yourself, it'll change how you behave yourself. If you change how you see yourself and how you behave yourself, it'll change how you reproduce yourself. Because your kids, your, your, your homies, your people around you, your buddies, your clan, they are following, they're watching, and they're probably emulating a lot of what you do. And they're going to have the same insecurities you have. They might have the same addictions you've got if you don't learn to arrest those things and give them something else, a different version of you. God wants you to be empowered to do that today. So here's kind of the deal. It's, a, it's kind of like this. What I try to do is make it clear and understandable. Okay? Right? I try to make it clear and understandable, but you've got to make it out livable. You've got to employ it into the daily life. And I believe that's really what you want because, because I know that if you have your car and your car's got a problem and you take it to the mechanic, you want your mechanic to say, I understand what the problem is, ma'am. Sir, I understand exactly what the problem is. Now, would you be satisfied with that? That he understood the problem? <laughs> no, you would want him to help solve the problem, right? If you're not feeling too good and you go to your doctor and say, doctor, doctor, I am feeling too good. And he says, I understand exactly what's wrong with you. <laughs> but he pushed you right out the door. You would be unpleased with that doctor, wouldn't you? Because you don't want him to understand what's wrong with you. You want him to help fix what's wrong with you, Right? Same story goes here. I can help you understand what's wrong and what's right, but you're the only one that can employ it. You're the only one that can do something about it. And so when we talk about changing our identity, we're not talking about pastor talking about a different identity. We're talking about you living a different identity. Anybody want to do that in the house? So if you will do that, God will do that. If you step into that space, God will meet you there and he'll transform who you really are from the inside out. But you got to give him that piece of you. I'll bring mine if you bring yours. I'll bring my best, you bring your best. And you and I in five months will be different people because we finally got a hold of who God says we are. We're looking at several things that we call fundamentals. We're saying last week we talked about focus. I said if uh, what you focus on will form you. What you um, contemplate, you'll emulate. What you see the most, 
you'll be the most. So last week we talked about how, how, how big a deal it is that these five months, in fact, this whole year, we're focusing on fundamentals, right? It's, it's keeping your eye on the prize. It's saying what matters most is, is emphasized most. That's what we're doing all this year to help reboot all of us from a crazy COVID weird, weird world that we've just been through. We got to reboot because a lot of us got, we got disconnected, not just from church, and we watched online, but we got disconnected from a rhythm of being in tandem and in sync and in step with Jesus. And so we want to get back in step with him. So as we do that, we're focusing on some fundamentals. One of those fundamentals is our mission statement. Uh, It's not in your notes. Hopefully it's in your head. Meeting people. Yeah, could you hear that? Those of you who are new, uh, meeting people where they are and loving them to where Christ wants them to be. Uh, We prefer loving them versus guilting them, shaming them, condemning them, beating them up. (laughs) Right? We want to love you to where Jesus wants you to be, right? Nice mission, right? Our vision, which is that preferred view of the future, and everybody has to have vision because the Bible says in Proverbs 29, without vision, people perish. They just get kind of lost. They forget who they are, where they're going, and why they're going there. So vision's critical. So our vision is this. If it's not on the screen, oh, there it is. It's right on the screen. So you can say it with me. It's easy. Follow along. Uh, We are becoming a loving community of growing disciples, mentoring the next generation to live the mission of Jesus through the power of the gospel. What are some of you not fist-bumping kind of people? Huh? Let's pump our fists a little bit here. Just say that last one. Through the power of the gospel. Say it again. Through the power of the gospel. The gospel tells us the first thing that applies to me. I am loved. Now, still looking at that vision statement, it has four big parts. I am loving. I hope you are. I am a disciple. I hope you are. I am a mentor. Are you? I am a missionary. Are you? Those four things have an have a undergirding premise to them. And that undergirding premise is that you are loved. So that comes out of the gospel. That comes out of the gospel. We'll look a little more deeply at that in a little bit. Out of that vision statement of who we are corporately, it has individual application. Who I am is a reflection of what that is. Who we are as the body of Christ should overflow into our individual lives. That's our five I am statements. I am, do you remember these? I am loved, I am loving, I am a disciple, I'm a mentor, I'm a missionary, say it with me, I am loved, I am loving, I am a disciple, I am a mentor, I am a missionary. Say it backwards, no, just kidding. (laughs) Although that would be good exercise. Okay, so part of what we want to do is we we want to recognize that repetition is powerful. In fact, if you do not embrace repetition, you'll stay just the way you are. I'll say it again because it should stick. If you do not embrace repetition, you'll stay right where you are. I'm going to introduce you to a a gal that has been doing brain research for over 30 years. And her research, when she first started way back in the 80s, it was thought to be like, I'm not sure this is right. I'm not sure this is true. And now it's accepted as fact. And it matches with biblical truth. It matches with biblical truth of what science now has discovered about the brain, God has always said about the brain. Because God says, you've got to use your head. I gave it to you for a reason. Have you ever had someone say, what were you thinking? Have you ever had somebody say it to you when you did something rather stupid? Have you ever had someone say, what were you thinking for crying out loud? What the hell were you thinking? (laughs) Anybody have someone tell them that? Right? Why? It's because our thinking can get all screwed up. Our thinking can totally go sideways and take us to places where we do not need to be. But when your thinking changes, you change. So when we look at our, when we look at this statement, this statement about I am loved, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna pull that apart. We're gonna pull every little piece of that apart today. Because I like the statement, I wrote it. (laughs) I should like it. But do you know what it is? It's kind of a it's kind of a warm fuzzy, right? It's warm fuzzy. So we haven't said it yet, so let's say the I am statement. I will focus on and celebrate that I am God's, you should, you should say this with me, that I'm God's beloved child, that he loved me when I was unlovely, unworthy, and undeserving, that I might begin to see myself through his eyes, that I'm a child of God, deeply loved, 
completely forgiven, fully pleasing, totally accepted by God, chosen by Him to reflect His love and grace. Now, I don't have any, um, any imagination, any illusion that that's exactly who you think you are. But I know it could be, and it will be, if you join in. If you're not too macho to say it with me. And if you're enough of a student to say it every day hereafter. It has the power to change your life. Because it has the power to change your identity. Because it's rooted in truth. So I said it's a warm fuzzy, and it is. It's a nice little cozy statement about who God says we are. But I want us to look today not only at the warm fuzzy side of it. I want you to look at the absolutely theological rootedness that it has. It has four things that are true about us, about our good news, which is the gospel, about our good fortune, which is God's grace, about our good standing, which is God's righteousness, and about our good work, which flows out of who we really are, our identity. That's the theological backdrop for this statement. So we're going to look at that because some of you, that matters. Some of you doesn't care. Just give me the warm fuzzy. (laughs) But some of you want to go, does this Bible really say that? Yes, it does. I'll show you exactly why it says it. The first thing we want to do is recognize in this statement, if we're going to begin to employ it, right? I can deploy it, but you've got to employ it. If that's going to happen, we've got to begin to kind of understand the first part of that is absolutely critical. I will focus. So first of all, we're going to take apart these little bullets. So this is under point number one, which is our good news. Our good news is the gospel. The gospel is the good news. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, the apostle Paul says this. Listen how much, what, how he elevates the idea of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God for the salvation, the rescue of everyone who believes. That's everyone who believes. God says, I want to, I want to give you that embrace. Now, understanding the gospel is a big thing. Everything about Christianity revolves around the gospel. Our good news. It's good news that we're loved. This statement is good news because it says you're loved. It says you matter. It says God had you at such a high level, he was willing to give his most precious thing to get you back. That's good news. So here's Ed Stetzer, who is uh, the editor of Christianity Today, amazing uh, theological mind, has said this about the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God, who's more holy than we can imagine, looked upon with compassion people who are more sinful than we could possibly admit, and sent his son Jesus into history to establish his kingdom and reconcile people and the world to himself. Jesus, whose love is more extravagant than we can measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that by his death and resurrection, we might gain through his grace what the Bible defines as new and eternal life. It's a good definition, isn't it? It's a little weighty, but it's good. It's got a lot of substance to it. That's the gospel, this good news. This good news empowers us to recognize who God says we are. So under that, let's think first of all about this first statement of our I am. I will focus. I will focus. I spent all last week, if you weren't here, go back and watch. Um, I spent all last week talking about that, talking about focus. It's critical. Why? Because your focus forms you. What you contemplate, you emulate. What you see the most, you'll be the most. Your focus is critical. It's keeping the main thing the main thing. It's keeping your eye on the prize. It's focusing on fundamentals. Your focus is critical, and our focus these days is all over the place. And therefore, we wonder why I can't gain any traction. I just kind of keep spinning my wheels. It's because you're not systematically focusing. Systematically means one after another left foot in front of right foot, left foot in front of right foot. I'm going to focus. When you do that kind of focus, you are changed. So here's the mind work for that. The biblical work for that is Proverbs 23, verse 7. The King James Version says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, your thoughts make you who you are. Your thoughts create the stories you tell yourself about yourself. I'm cool because I drive a nice car. I'm handsome by worldly standards, so people must love me. Someone else that's really special thinks I'm special, so that must make me more special. We have all kinds of ways of telling ourselves we have meaning, but they're all rooted in what the world says and not very rooted at all in what God says. 
So we've got to make that shift. We've got to shift our focus to what God says about who we are. But here's the mind science behind that. So Dr. Carolyn Leaf has written a book. It's written several books, but the latest one that I got turned on to is called uh, Switch on the Brain. Switch on the Brain. And she's studied for over 30 years, going on, going on 40 years. And she's not only studied the science of the brain, but she's applied that to people, especially children that have brain injury or anyone that has a brain injury or some of the special needs. And he's seen them literally think their way to a stronger brain. Think their way to a different brain. She says this, we, when we think, as we think, we change the physical nature of the brain. As we consciously direct our thoughts, we some wire. <laughs> we can wire out our toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. This is the process. This is the process whenever we give you an I am statement, we say, why should you meditate on that? Because it'll make pastor happy? <laughs> no, please don't do it for that reason. Although that will make me happy. But don't do it for that reason. Do it because it'll make you happy. It'll change who you are. Literally, when we think, we change the physical nature and makeup of the brain. So in neuro psychology or neuro research that's research about the brain it's called neuroplasticity your brain is moldable changeable neuro meaning the brain plasticity means changeable moldable you can change your brain but not if you don't change your thinking you're stuck with the same old brain that tells you you're a loser you're, you should quit. This relationship's too hard. You'll never make it. You'll never achieve it. Or falsely say you're the best of all, which causes you to just look down on the rest of us. God wants you to rewire your thinking so it'll change your brain. And when you do, you understand what the Bible means when it says you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says take captive every thought, which is the first process of changing anything about your thoughts, is you've got to know what you're thinking. And so part of what I'll be nurturing you to do in the rest of this year is to take captive the rest of your thoughts. So you start recognizing, oh, that was a pretty crappy thought. Well, that was, a, that was not healthy. Uh, that, that didn't build any up. In fact, it tore me down and others down too. You start catching your thoughts. Now you can change your thoughts, but if you don't catch them, you can't change them. So part of what we'll be doing is learning to focus because focus says, oh, wow, guess what? I just caught a whole litany of things I tell myself that keep bringing me down and keeping me where I am, so I'm spinning my wheels. Every addict needs to recognize the thoughts that they tell themselves because their thoughts give them justification and rationalization to keep going back to their addictive substance. Alcohol, sex, drugs, smoking, whatever it is, the addictive thought brings me back and says, this is how I justify it. Until you catch it, you can't change it. It requires focus. One of my favorite authors, Dallas Lord, says the ultimate freedom we have as individuals is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon or think about. And by think, we mean all the ways that we are aware of things, memories, perceptions, beliefs. The focus of your thoughts significantly affects everything else in your life, and it evokes your feelings which frame your world and motivate your actions. Are you ready to change your thoughts? Yeah, some of you, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I'm not too sure. Well, I'm telling you, you can stay right where you are. You can stay right back here in this place that you do not like and you do not feel loved and you think you got to earn your position into anything and everything. Or you can say, yeah, I do want to change my thoughts because God's got a better thought. <laughs> this is an extra credit verse just dropped in. Um, Isaiah 55, 7 says, for my, God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And here's the beautiful thing. God wants to give us his thoughts. His thought on the matter of you. His thought on the matter of you. Therefore, what we're saying is, is we want to do something. We want to, we want to focus on something different. And here's part of the reason why. A study was done by the Barna Group, which is a research, Christian research group in, 19, in 2021, so just last year. 
And they found studying millennials, anybody a millennial? You're probably somewhere in your late 20s to early 40s if you're a millennial. If you're younger than that, you're a Generation Z. And they're probably, more, it's more compounded probably if you're Generation Z. But the study was done of millennials, Christian millennials, by the way. And they discovered they are saturated with digital content. They, brains are saturated with digital content. That means basically they got one of these. And they're on it all the time. I was been, been with a friend uh, several several times this week, and I, I noticed how compulsively he reaches for his phone. It's like he's constantly. It's just like this is constantly kind of look, looking at it. I was thinking, oh, we haven't talked about it yet, but we will. We are saturated by digital content. They found that in a year's time, the average millennial, Christian millennial absorbs, soaks in over 3,000 hours of digital content, of which only 150 of those hours has anything to do with Jesus or something about God. That's a 20 to 1 ratio. 20 to 1 ratio. You know what that does? That puts you behind the curve because there's no way you're going to change what you think about yourself if you've got a 20 to 1 ratio of what the world says about you you've got to change the ratio that means you've got to step up and say pastor i heard what you said now i got to say some things myself one is i'm going to cut back on my digital content unless there's a good news you can find good content on here but you can also find a lot of bad stuff on here where you're focusing because if we're going to be different people, we've got to have a different focus. I will focus on, say this first line with me, I'll focus on and celebrate that I am God's beloved child. That was really weak. Let's do it again because I've got a lot of grace for you. I will focus on and celebrate that I'm God's beloved child. I love this because he wants us not just to know it. He wants us to celebrate good times. Come on. I mean, yeah, he wants us to, to celebrate good times. We're going to have a good time tonight, right? If we change the what we tell ourselves. So instead of having a good time around sex or drugs or alcohol or smoking, a little bit of one of those is okay, but the rest of them, not so much. God wants you. Some of you are just catching up with that. God, God wants you to absorb who he says you are. And he wants you to celebrate it. I love that. God wants us to celebrate that we are special to him, that he knows us and loves us. He paid for us to get us back to himself. God wants you and I to recognize, as it says in Psalms, the psalmist says, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, oh, your faithfulness to the skies. How priceless is your unfailing love. Do you see the celebration of that? Well, you cannot read the Psalms without hearing the psalmist celebrate who God says we are. First John, the, the Apostle John, soaked up so much who Jesus said he was. He would just, he could proclaim it. He says, see, because it changes the way we see. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's who we really are. Amen. That's who you are. I wasn't, I wasn't sure where I wanted to throw this in, but I'm going to throw it in because it's one of the, it's the, it's the most amazing um, proclamation by Jesus about what I'm trying to get across here. It's a story that Jesus told about a dad that loved his, he had two boys, he loved them both. I'm going to tell you about the first boy. Save the story for the second boy till later. It's recorded in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through about 24. It says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living and after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Ah, oh, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, 
How many of my fathers hired me and have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll, I'll sit out and go back to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he set out, went back to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Oh, for this son of mine who was dead is alive again. Who was lost, is found. Say it with me. And so they began celebrate good times. Come on! Right? What do you think Jesus wanted us to know about that story? That you matter beyond comprehension to the God who made you. You matter beyond comprehension for the God that made you, that He loved you so much that He sent His one and only Son to pay the price to get you back. That's who you really are. You see, when we learn to focus on and celebrate that we are God's beloved children, that first sentence, we haven't got to the second two yet, will change you because it's good news. It's good news. Now, here's the deal. Not only is this good news, it's also good fortune. <laughs> and our good fortune is that God's grace is available for us. The gospel is all of it. But the good news of the gospel tells us about our good fortune, which is God's grace, which means you get something you don't deserve. You get something you haven't earned. You get something you didn't perform for. That's grace. That's grace. So we pick up our statement. Read this next part with us. That you loved me when I was unlovely, unworthy, and undeserving, that I might begin to see myself through your eyes. You see, when John in John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See how great the love the Father has lavished on us? I bet John handed mine the story Jesus told. He was there, heard him tell it. But he had it in mind that we are the children of God. And part of what's so powerful about that is, is that what God does, he loves us when we're not so lovely. You and I struggle with that. You got anybody in your world that's not too lovely and you're struggling to love them? <laughs> yeah, hopefully you're not doing this, <laughs> right? But we do. We have all kinds of people like that. But the, but the beauty is, is, is that God loves us even when we're not lovely and we're, not deser we're undeserving. We're unworthy. He still loves us. Robert Munger, um, a pastor in Berkeley for many, many years, wrote a beautiful little book called um, My Heart, Christ's Home. Great little book. A lot of you may have read that little book. He says something powerful. He says, the church is the only fellowship in the world whose one requirement for membership is the unworthiness of the candidate. Isn't that good? The church is the only organization, the only fellowship in the world whose one requirement for membership is the unworthiness of the candidate. We don't get to Jesus because we're worthy. He finds us because we're not. That's God's grace. It's God's grace. Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 6 says it like this. You see, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man. Someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still unlovely, undeserving, unworthy, undeserving. Died for us. He demonstrates his love for us. Why? Because that juxtaposition of we don't deserve it and he would do it, 
brings us into a new place of sonship. It changes our view of ourselves. Because what the world tells me is, you're unlovely, you're unworthy, and you don't deserve it, so go to hell. That's what the world will say to you. But God says, I went to hell for you, to bring you back. Because you matter that much to me. And when you I start grabbing and grasping and holding on to this truth, it can radically change everything else in our world and life because it changes how we see ourselves. Change how you see yourself, it'll change how you behave yourself. Change how you behave yourself, it'll change how you reproduce yourself. God says, you matter. Okay, the next statement, not only is the good news, the gospel tell us about this great thing we have, and not only does it bring us this good fortune that's God's grace, but it also leads us to our good standing, which is God's righteousness. Our good standing, which is God's righteousness. I have this memorizing a little different version, so I'm not going to look at anything to kind of confuse myself. Remember the verse I gave you, Romans 1.16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Verse 17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. But who, who are the righteous? Those that are squeaky clean? No. Those that know they're not. He's not talking about our righteousness. Because when the Bible talks about our righteousness, it calls it self-righteousness. And the Bible says, that's like filthy rags. He's talking about God's righteousness. Being right in who God sees us and who he's making us to be. He puts us in good standing with himself. So all the rest of these statements are all about the standing that you and I get to enjoy when we're truly in that relationship with him. And when we're in that relationship with God, all of a sudden something begins to change in who we are. Probably the, one of the most succinct passages about God's good standing, us being in God's standing, is Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. For he, God, reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death so that by that he may present you holy in his sight. Are you holy? No. But he presents you holy in his sight. Are you without blemish? No. Are you without accusation? No. But he presents you as without blemish and without accusation. All of those things are what drive the next four statements in our, in our, in our, in our statement. So say it with me. That we, that I'm a child of God, do you love complete? Ah, that I'm a child of, okay, ready, set, go. That I'm a child of God. Deeply loved. Completely forgiven. Fully pleasing. Totally accepted by God. Chosen by him to reflect his love and grace. Do you believe it? A little bit. We're going to take that little bit and we're going to grow it a little more each week until it becomes your new mental mantra. Your mantra is? It's something you say over and over and over and over and over again. I told you when we got started, if you're not comfortable with repetition, you better start becoming comfortable with it. Because without repetition of your mind, you're going to stay right where you've always been. You've always been. And I can meet you there, but I can't move you from there. I can meet you where you are, but I can't move you from where you are unless you're willing to be loved to a better place where God wants you to be. That's the transformation of our minds that we're all moving towards. So let's look at these, these four items. It's a little bit um, like this. You and I, when we come to Jesus, we look like anybody else. In fact, when Jesus became man... He came and looked just like anybody else. There was nothing, the Bible says, that differentiated Jesus. He wasn't some super physical being. He came looking like any other carpenter's son. But he came to us to make us who he is. And we meet him, we meet Jesus, and we say, Jesus, we want you. And so many of you meet Jesus. You come to church and say, gosh, Jesus, I want to be like you. Would you please fill me up with your presence? And so you hear a wonderful message. And all of a sudden, you start saying, oh, man, I love God. Man, I love God. And by the time you get home, you've already forgot everything I've said. Because it drains right out of you. Dr. Caroline Leaf tells us in her book, that's because you suffer from a thing called short-term memory. And you hear something on a short term on a Sunday, and by Monday, you've already forgotten it. And instead of being a, an overflow of God in your life, you're already on empty. 
And now you're trying to pretend you're a better Christian, but the problem is you're serving on empty and you've got nothing left to give. But when you and I come to a place where we begin to say, Jesus, who you are is a God that says, when I understand who you are, I'm willing to say, God, I want to I embrace everything you say about me and I want to be in you. And the Bible says when we're in Christ, everything changes. Now when I'm in Christ, all of a sudden, this position I have is one where I'm no longer leaking what I've got, but I'm still overflowing because I'm full. Are you full? When we begin to grasp who God says we are, it changes everything else about who we are. But until we begin to, with repetition, remind ourselves, what is that thing I'm going to focus on and celebrate? I'm going to focus on and celebrate that I am God's beloved child. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. I'm trying to remember that. Oh, that he loved me when I was unlovely, unworthy, undeserving, that I might begin to to his eyes. Are you with me? I mean, I can say it. I can memorize it, but I can't do it for you. I can diagnose your car. The doctor can diagnose your health. But only you can fill up your gas tank. Only you can make sure your oil is filled. Only you, if you got the electric car, good for you. It's awesome. Only you can plug in your battery. And if you're not, you're dead in the water. And the way you plug in your battery and the way you fill your tank and the way you check your oil is every day reminding yourself of who and whose you really are. Deeply loved. Completely forgiven. Fully pleasing. Totally accepted by God, chosen by Him to reflect His love and grace. I hope you believe it enough to start filling your tank with it, to start charging your batteries with it, because it'll change you, it'll make you someone new. So let's go really quickly through this, okay? Uh, so deeply loved, that's a good one. That's a good one. How, how deep is God's love? If I'm deeply loved, just how deep is it? The Apostle Paul wanted believers to know this so badly that he prayed this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high here it is. And deep is the, that you would know this love that surpasses knowledge. Do you get the idea that God's love is a little bit hard for us to get our arms around? But he's praying, I hope you do. I hope you try to get your arms around it. Because if you get your arms around it, you got to get your mind around it as well. And if you do those things, if you get your mind around it and your arms around it, maybe your feet will start walking in it. Maybe you'll start living it and showing it and breathing it and eating it. And if you do, it'll fill your tank. It'll charge your battery. And you will know, no matter what the world says about you, you can't touch me because I'm deeply loved. God wants it for you. Deeply loved. I love completely forgiven. Look at this little trio of verses. I love these guys. Psalms 103 verse 12 says, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know how far that is. That's a long ways. <laughs> Your sins, Micah 7, 19, God, you will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. And then he puts up a no fishing sign because he knows you. <laughs> You'll try to fish him out. Puts up a no fishing sign. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, he says, and I will be merciful to them and I will remember their sins no more. His forgetters, obviously, even better than yours. <laughs> You can forget my sermon by Monday, but he forgets your sermons for all Mondays. He forgets your sins for the rest of your life and all of eternity. Do you know the Rolls-Royce company? Have you heard of that? Rolls-Royce. It's a car. Do you know that, right? You knew that. They're pretty good cars from what I understand. I've seen them. 
There was a fellow in the United States that had a, had a Rolls Royce. They were, built, they were built in Manchester, England. And there was a little problem with his Rolls Royce. And so he called the Rolls people in England. And he said, there's a problem with my Rolls Royce. And they're going, what? Yeah. He said, what? Tell us what. So they told him what the problem was. And within a week, there was a technician at his door knocking on his door with a little toolbox. He said, can I see your car? He goes, yeah, it's in the garage. Help yourself. Went in the garage, heard some stuff going on out there. And all of a sudden, the guy's just gone. No bill, no receipt, nothing. Not a trace. No, no oil spills, nothing. The guy's just poofed, gone. So he calls the Rolls company in Manchester and says, hey, this, this, this is what happened. I called you guys, you sent a technician, and the problem, I mean, fixed, fixed the car, but, but what's the bill? What do I owe you guys? And the person out there said, I'm sorry, sir. We have no record of any problem with any Rolls Royce ever. <laughs> and when you say yes to Jesus, he says, and Satan says, you're all that and trash. Jesus says, I have no record of anything against my child because they are all mine. <laughs> that's, that's, not just good news, it's good fortune. It's not just good fortune, it's a good standing with God because he says you are deeply loved and you are completely forgiven and you are fully pleasing. Fully pleasing, I love this little passage. Uh, in Matthew, it's the, it's the story that, that we have of Jesus getting baptized. And what's interesting about this uh, record, this account of Jesus getting baptized is that prior to this, Jesus does nothing. He doesn't preach any sermons, doesn't heal anybody, there's no miracles done. And so when he gets baptized, the significance is immense because there's been no performance. There's been no showing of his talents, skills, and abilities. The gospels are silent, but at his baptism, the heavens open and the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If Jesus didn't have to earn the pleasure of the Father, neither do you. He is pleased with you. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh, but did he see what I did last week? <laughs> <laughs> yep, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. So here's the deal. What God's very good at, what you and I are not so hot at, God can differentiate your behavior from your son's hip. He can differentiate sometimes how you behave yourself and how he sees you. God always sees you with pleasure. It's what every parent does with that toddler that only does crying, screaming, and pooping. <laughs> we see their value and we are pleased with them. And he sees that in you. So stop screaming and <laughs> We're deeply Sam with me. We're deeply loved. We're completely forgiven. We're fully pleasing. We're totally accepted by God. You see, this is the grasp of what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, for it is by grace you've been saved. Grace, remember, getting undeserved favor. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to, to do good works. Now, I want you to recognize that something happens out of this free gift. That is, means if, if I didn't do anything to get it, I can't do anything to keep it. Where it wouldn't make any sense if God says, I'm going to give this to you, but now you've got to step up or I'm taking it away. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. The God that says, this is a free gift now, it's a gift for the rest of your life, that's called God's grace. It's the good news. It's the good favor. It's the good standing. And out of that comes this ability, the Apostle Paul says to us, that we should emulate this behavior John, uh, Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as God in Christ accepted you. How did he accept you? Faults, sins, shortcomings, being unloving, undeserving, all those things, unworthy, 
All those things, he accepts you in that space and place to bring you to a better place where your standing is that you are deeply loved, completely forgiven, fully pleasing, totally accepted by God, chosen by him. Now, this is the last point in our notes. Chosen by him to do something. So look at this. So if we've got God's good news, if we've got his good favor, if we are in his good standing, out of the overflow of that comes our good works. You do no good deed to get redemption. You do any good deed because of redemption. Are you with me? Are you tracking it? You like it. God wants us, he wants us to understand it, the diagnosis, so we can now live out a different prognosis. We can now live out a different expression of who God says we are. When those things begin to happen, they happen because you got on board and said, I'm going to charge my battery every day. I'm going to fill my tank, even if it's $6 a (laughs) every day. (laughs) God, I'm I'm on board, God. I'm on board. I want to do my part. God's done his part. Will you do yours? Will you do yours? Look at this last verse, Colossians chapter, chapter 3, verse 12. My uh, memorized translation is just a tad different. I apologize for not catching it earlier. Um, notice what comes first. Therefore, as God's chosen people. Now, notice, the, notice our standing. Holy, right? God's chosen people. Holy and dearly loved. You know what that is? That's your identity. He's saying because of who you are, because of seeing yourself differently, now behave yourself differently. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love because it Binds everything else together. And when you do, all of a sudden you know that you are not who you used to be, but the one he's called you to be. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to simply just invite you into that space and place where you make decisions. You don't make decisions because a pastor preaches a sermon. You make a decision because the Spirit's convicted your heart. And I want to invite you to simply allow God to speak to your heart in such a way that out of the overflow of your heart, a decision can be made. A decision to trust God with every ounce of your being. And to stay the course, to to seek to not miss a week because... You need your cup filled more than once a week, but once a week will help remind you that you need to do it every single day. Stay plugged in. Stay connected to the source. Because as you change your thinking, you change the physical nature of your brain. And as you consciously direct your thoughts, you wire out the toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with what is true and healthy about you. I want to invite you wherever you are in your journey to simply whisper this little prayer. If you've sensed God stirring your heart, then then step into this prayer space with me and just whisper these words. Dear Heavenly Father, as much as I know how, I want skin in the game. Thank you for dying for me, for showing such extravagant love to get me back. Father, thank you for running to me, throwing your arms around me, kissing me, robing me with your righteousness. I accept your great love. I accept your forgiveness. 
I accept your pleasure. I embrace your acceptance. Help me reflect who you are. If you are, for the first time, accepting who Jesus is, for some of you, maybe it is. Maybe it's your first time you've said yes to him. I just celebrate that with you because I'm excited. I'm hoping that you'll focus on and celebrate that you're God's beloved child. That's who you are. For some of you, you've struggled to believe it, but today you're a little closer. For some of you, you recognize that you've been allowing your focus to be on a thousand different things. Digital content overflows and you're ready to change your mind about your engagement with truth, scripture, what God says. So welcome. Welcome to that space. Make it happen. Let's make it happen. So Jesus, we ask your blessing on our steps as we leave this place that something about what we've heard will be so sticky it, it just never leaves us. That will happen as we review it, we meditate on it, and it shapes who we are. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen.